Hello all, in this video, we are going to discuss about certain important topics and questions which you will encounter when you are presenting an antenatal case. These topics are very important when we are dealing with an antenatal case for a clinical social case presentation. First, in antenatal case, you need to be clear about what is gravida, para, abortion and stillbirth. Gravida is the number of pregnancies which include the present pregnancy also and para means the total number of pregnancies which has crossed the period of viability that is 28 weeks. So, any pregnancy which has completed 28 weeks will be included under the para. Abortion as per the WHO definition, it is expulsion or extraction of the fetus or embryo from its mother when it weighs less than 500 grams. So that will be considered as a abortion. Stillbirth is the delivery of the dead fetus which should weigh more than 1000 grams or after 28 weeks of gestation or attainment of at least 35 centimeter of crown heel length. So when the fetus comes out after 28 weeks or when it is weighing more than 1000 grams or measuring more than 35 centimeters of crown heel length then it will be considered as stillbirth. How are we classifying the trimesters in the pregnancy? First trimester is the period between conception up to 12 weeks. Then the second trimester is from the 13th week to 27 weeks. Third trimester is from 28 to 40 weeks. So the first and third trimester will be nearly 12 weeks and the second trimester will be slightly lengthier that is 14 weeks. The next common question is how will you confirm pregnancy? Pregnancy can be confirmed by two common means. First is the urine pregnancy test and by ultrasound. Urine pregnancy test where we detect the HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin which is produced after six days after fertilization. So when there is a presence of HCG in the urine which we detect by urine pregnancy test kits which can be performed at even home can confirm a pregnancy and this will be routinely done after any delayed menstrual cycle when they are expecting a pregnancy. The second common type to confirm pregnancy is ultrasound. Sound. While visualizing through ultrasound, the uterus contains the gestational sac during the pregnancy which is typically visualized in the center of the uterine body at 4 to 5 weeks of gestation. The fetal heartbeat becomes detectable at 6 weeks of gestational age and is described initially as flickering structure. The placenta is visible by 10 weeks of gestational age with a transabdominal ultrasound. And the presence of this fetal heartbeat not only confirms the pregnancy but also confirms a viable fetus. Next is Nagel rule. Nagel's rule is used to find out the estimated date of delivery. We calculate the estimated date of delivery from the last menstrual period that is the first day of last menstrual period. From that we add 9 months and 7 days and we calculate estimated date of delivery. If suppose the first day of last menstrual period as February 1, 23. You need to add 9 months and 7 days to it. So the estimated date of delivery will be November 8, 23. Suppose if you are crossing the next year you can 3 months and add 7 days then the estimated delivery will be obtained. This rule is called as Nagel's rule for calculating the expected date of delivery. Then what are all the investigations required at the first visit of antenatal mother? We will conduct the urine routine examination test which includes urine, albumin, sugar and deposits. Next will be complete blood count where our focus will be on the hemoglobin. Next will be on the blood grouping and RH typing. This is for arranging the blood and also expecting the RH incompatibility inducing the neonatal jaundice. Then routinely we do HIV, hepatitis B, HBSAG, RPR or VDRL test for screening syphilis. Then we conduct glucose fasting and postprandial and random for detection of gestational diabetes mellitus. And now recently thyroid stimulating hormone is also included along with the investigations which is needed for the antenatal mothers at their first visit. Then the next common question is what are all the danger signs in pregnancy? Sluggish pains or no pains after the rupture of the membrane brain, good pains for an hour after the rupture of the membrane but there is no progress of labor. The prolapse of cord or hand will be considered as a danger sign. Then meconium stained liquor or slow, irregular or excessively fast fetal heart, excessive show or bleeding during the labor, collapse during the labor, placenta not separated within half an hour after delivery, postpartum hemorrhage or collapse and a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius or over during the labor. During the labor. All will be considered as the danger signs in pregnancy. Then we move on to the warning signs in pregnancy. These warning 
signs are very important so that we need to educate the mothers regarding this warning signs and when this warning signs appears they should immediately seek the health care and get the underlying problem corrected the first is swelling of feet fits or seizures headache blurring of vision all will be the signs of pregnancy induced hypertension preeclampsia and eclampsia bleeding or discharge per vagina severe abdominal pain decreased fetal movement or any unusual movements or any unusual symptoms will be considered as a warning signs in pregnancy and remember this is warning signs which is different from the previous danger signs which is for the healthcare provider when we are handling a pregnancy this warning signs will be for the for educating the mother in order to screen for certain complications during the pregnancy and they need to look for this symptoms in their home then what are all called as high risk pregnancy at risk approach means there are certain group of people where the presence of complications will be at higher incidence so those group of people will be high risk population and the targeting these people will be considered as at risk approach and in pregnancy we call this as high risk pregnancies we classify this high risk pregnancies into four groups that is group 1 based on the baseline parameters such as age when less than to 18 years and more than 35 years height of the mothers when less than 140 cm obese mothers weight less than 40 kg overall weight gain when it is less than 5 kg multi gravid greater than 4 frequent pregnancies toxemia multiple pregnancies mal presentation or mal position of fetus all comes under group 1 of the high risk pregnancies group 2 high risk pregnancies means the previous bad reproductive history where three or more spontaneous consecutive abortions have occurred previous still birth intrauterine death manual removal of placenta early neonatal death prolonged pregnancy 14 days after expected date of delivery previous car dehiscence all comes under the group 2 high risk pregnancies that is previous bad reproductive history group 3 high risk pregnancies consist of the bad obstetric history where history of previous cesarean or instrumental delivery history of prolonged third stage of labor history of antepartum or postpartum hemorrhage all comes under group 3 high risk pregnancies or bad obstetric history group 4 high risk pregnancies include mothers with systemic disease where pregnancy is associated with general diseases such as cardiovascular disease kidney disease diabetes tuberculosis liver disease malaria epilepsy asthma hiv rta sta will be included under general diseases complicating pregnancy then anemia seizures gat disease hypertension all comes under group 4 high risk pregnancies mothers with systemic disease so high risk approach in pregnancies will be commonly asked so you need to answer the high risk pregnancies by classifying it into the above mentioned four groups now what is additional calorie and protein requirement in pregnancy so the additional calorie requirement during pregnancy is 350 kilo calorie per day then additional protein requirement is 9.5 grams during the second trimester and 22 gram during the third trimester so this is the additional calorie and protein requirement during the pregnancy what is the normal weight gain expected in pregnancy normally a woman should gain up to 9 to 11 kg during her pregnancy ideally the weight gain will be 2 kg at the first trimester then the rate of weight gain increases as the gestational age increases so the normal weight gain during pregnancy is 9 to 11 kg during the pregnancy then about the importance of early registration in pregnancy the advantages include recording of the last date of menstrual period and calculation of expected date of delivery using nagel's rule can be done the gestational age determination can be correctly done if we record the date of lmp early then we can provide immunization as early as possible then also we can assess the health status of the mother and we can obtain the baseline health status of the mother like weight blood pressure etc it facilitates proper planning and allows for adequate care to be provided during pregnancy for both mother and the fetus it helps in timely detection of complications at an early stage and manage them appropriately by referral when it is required genetic and congenital disease screening can be done when early registration is done folic acid and iron supplementation can be given to lower the incidence of anemia sexually transmitted diseases screening and treatment can be done we can develop a rapport with the mother and also we can provide the option of abortion if the pregnancy is earlier at later stage it is either difficult or may not be possible then about the tt immunization that has become td immunization nowadays for pregnant women we have two doses the first dose should be as early as the pregnancy is detected the second dose will be 4 weeks after the first dose of td vaccine then tdb 
or the TD booster will be given if the pregnancy occurs within three years of the previous pregnancy and two doses were two TD doses were received during that pregnancy. If the current pregnancy is after three years of the last pregnancy, then we need to provide two doses of TD. What does this TD contains? TT previously it was called as tetanus toxoid. TD means tetanus and adult diphtheria vaccine, which is a combination of tetanus and diphtheria, lower concentrations of diphtheria antigen as recommended for older children and adults. So it is WHO pre-qualified, contains VVM and this vaccine shelf life is nearly two to three years. The preservative added for this vaccine is thiomersol. The purpose of this TD immunization is to prevent the maternal, neonatal and post-abortal tetanus. Will boost immunity and prevent diphtheria outbreaks also. So the dose is 0.5 ml. The root is intramuscular. Site is upper arm. Preferably the non-dominant arm. That is for right-handed individuals, left upper arm will be the preferred site. So we need to remember D means the lower concentration of diphtheria antigen and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare recommends this. TD is freeze and heat sensitive. Open vial policy is applicable to TD vaccine. Shake test is also applicable for this vaccine. The four antenatal visits. Usually the antenatal visits will be at least once in a month for seven months and then in the eighth month once in two weeks then later once in a week is recommended. That is the usual number of antenatal visits required. But there will be at least minimum of four antenatal visits recommended for antenatal mothers. Those four antenatal visits should be preferably should be distributed like this. That is the first visit should be within 12 weeks of pregnancy. Preferably as soon as the pregnancy is detected for early registration of pregnancy and first antenatal checkup and certain routine blood investigations needs to be done. The second visit should be between 14 to 26 weeks. Third visit should be 28 to 34 weeks. And the fourth visit should be between 36 weeks and term. Then we need to know about expected number of pregnancies in a year. The expected number of pregnancies in a year will be calculated using the birth rate. If we have the birth rate of the population, that is total number of births per 1000 population, if we multiply with the population and divide it by 1000, we get the expected number of live births per year in that area. So as some pregnancies may not result in live birth, abortions and stillbirths may occur. Or in other words, these abortions and stillbirths will be included in pregnancies. So the expected number of live births would be an underestimation of the total number of pregnancies. So hence a correction factor of 10% is required. That is additionally 10% to the above figure according to the birth rate should be added. So the total number of expected pregnancies will be total number of live births plus 10% of this number of live births will provide the expected number of pregnancies. So as a thumb rule in any given month approximately half the number of pregnancies estimated above should be in your records. So the vaccine calculation and other services during antenatal period, postnatal period and the delivery services should be planned accordingly. Then what is birth preparedness and complication readiness? Awareness regarding danger signs during pregnancy, delivery and postpartum period all will be considered as danger signs during pregnancy and the awareness of this danger signs by the mother is in first birth preparedness and, comp and complication readiness criteria. Then we need to identify and arrange the emergency transport facility for the mother to reach the hospital and we need to identify and arrange the blood donor if there is blood transfusion required and we need to identify the institution for delivery. We need to keep the money aside for the delivery expenses. So the awareness, transport, blood donor, institution and the money all comprises of the birth preparedness and complication readiness. Then we should know about what is essential obstetric care. It includes early registration of pregnancy, minimum of four antenatal checkups, injection of two TT vaccines, minimum of 100 IFA tablets, institutional delivery, skilled birth attendant and delivery, detection of complications during antenatal and postnatal period all comes under essential obstetric care. We should know about what is emergency obstetric care. There are two types of emergency obstetric care. BMONC that is basic emergency obstetric care or CMONC comprehensive emergency obstetric care. Under basic emergency obstetric care we have the parenteral antibiotics, eutrotonics, anticonvulsants and the facilities for manual removal of the placenta and removal of retained products, assisted vaginal delivery and neonatal resuscitation should be provided in basic emergency obstetric care or BMONC. Whereas in comprehensive emergency obstetric care or CMONC, all of the above parameters along with that the facilities for cesarean delivery and blood transfusion should be present. Then that will be considered as a CMONC center. Next we move on to the bundle height measurements. 
start 12 weeks, the fundus will be just palpable above the pubic symphysis. Then we move on to the 24th week where the fundus height will be at the level of umbilicus. At the lower one third of the distance between this pubic symphysis and the umbilicus, 16th week fundal height will be there. At the two thirds of the distance between the pubic symphysis and the umbilicus will be there. And by 24 weeks, it will be at the level of umbilicus. Then at 36 weeks, it will be at the level of sippy sternum. And if we divide it into two compartments, at 28 weeks, it will be at the lower one third distance. And at 32 weeks, it will be at the upper one third distance between the umbilicus and the sippy sternum. When the flanks are full, then that will be considered as the 40 weeks. So how the gestational age can be identified with fundal height is at the level of pubic symphysis, just palpable at the level of pubic symphysis at 12 weeks, 24 weeks will be umbilicus. At 36 weeks, the fundal height will be at the sippy sternum level and at 40 weeks it will not touch the sippy sternum it will be at the slightly lower level when compared to the 36 week level but the flanks will be full at 40 weeks next we move on to the abdominal examination we have four type of abdominal examination that is for the fundal palpation or the fundal grip this manoeuvre helps to determine the lie and presentation of the fetus where we palpate the fetal lie and the presentation of the fetus then we have the lateral palpation or the lateral grip is used to locate the fetal back then we do the pelvic grip or the first pelvic grip or the superficial pelvic grip. The third maneuver must be performed gently. It helps to determine whether the head or the breech is present at the pelvic brim. If head cannot be moved, it indicates that the head is engaged. In case of a transfer lie, the third grip will be empty. The fourth maneuver, that is the second pelvic grip or the deep pelvic grip, this maneuver is, will be done by only by the experienced hands. They will be able to tell us about the degree of flexion of the head. So these are the four grips which we use during the abdominal examination of antenatal case. Thereby we identify the lie presentation and also whether the head is engaged or not. We move on to the anemia classification. In antenatal case, we need to look at this row alone which is very important. To call non-anemic, their hemoglobin level should be more than or equal to 11 grams per deciliter. 10 to 10.99 will be considered as a mild anemia. 7 to 9.99 will be considered as moderate anemia less than 7 will be considered as severe anemia. So for other group of population, the anemia classification is provided here, which is not significant in this presentation. Next, we move on to the iron and folic acid tablet formulations over different age and conditions. For pregnant mother, which is most important in this antenatal case, which should be 100 milligram of elemental iron and 0.5 milligram or 500 microgram of folic acid, which should be consumed daily. It has to be started after the first trimester at 14 to 16 weeks of gestation. For lactating mothers also, the dose frequency remains the same. They need to consume 100 days postpartum. Next important topic is the effects of anemia in pregnancy. Antenatally, there will be poor weight gain and there is high chance of preterm labor and preeclampsia. Intranatally, there will be dysfunctional labor, hemorrhage, shock and cardiac failure. During postnatal period, there will be higher incidence of purpural sepsis, subinvolution, the embolism will be present. For the fetus, there will be risk of prematurity, intrauterine growth retardation, low birth weight, low Apgar score, depleted iron stores in the neonates and anemia in the infancy period, high prevalence of failure to thrive and poor intellectual development when there is anemia present in pregnancy. Then what are all the advices you will provide when you are prescribing iron and folic acid tablets during the antenatal period? We need to provide the following advice that is the intake of iron and folic acid along with water or ascorbic acid based liquids like lemon water will be preferred. As it increases the iron absorption from the stomach and we should advise them not to take IFA tablets along with milk, tea or coffee as the substances such as whitein, tannin will prevent iron absorption. The passage of dark colored or black stools is very normal during iron tablet consumption. Preferably we need to take iron and folic acid half an hour after meals to avoid gastric discomfort and nausea. After taking iron and folic acid the mother may experience loose stools or constipation for some time but it will settle soon. Not to take along with the calcium as calcium inhibits iron absorption. So these are all the advices you need to provide when you are prescribing iron and folic acid tablets to antenatal mother. We need to understand what is a preterm delivery, term delivery and post-term delivery. Preterm delivery means the baby is born before the end of 37 weeks of gestation will be considered as preterm babies that is less than 259 days. Term babies are babies born after completing 37 weeks up to 42 completed weeks of gestation. Post 
term pregnancy means baby is born at 42 weeks completed or any time thereafter 42 weeks of gestation will be considered as post term delivery so less than 37 weeks will be considered as pre term 37 to 42 will be considered as term greater than 42 greater than or equal to 42 will be considered as post term pregnancy now the clinical social case will not end if we do not touch upon this maternity benefit schemes what antenatal mothers are entitled to get what is janani suraksha yojana janani suraksha yojana was launched in april 2005 to implement in all states and union territories with a special focus on low performing states basically jsy is a centrally sponsored scheme which integrates cash assistance with delivery and post delivery care the yojana has identified asha as an effective link between the government and the pregnant woman the scheme focuses on the poor pregnant woman with a special dis dispensation for states that have low institutional delivery rates which includes uttar pradesh uttarakhand bihar jharkhand madhya pradesh chatisgarh assam rajasthan orissa and jammu and kashmir while the states have been named low performing states the remaining states have been named high performing states now what is the cash assistance under jsy for institutional delivery it is divided into two categories based on the area of residence that is in rural area and urban area under which we have mothers package and asha's package in rural area in low performing states the mothers package will be 1400 rupees asha's package will be 600 rupees in rural area of high performing states it will be 700 and 600 for mother and asha respectively same way in urban areas in low performing states the mother's package will be 1000 asha's package will be 400 in high performing states it will be 600 and 400 for mother and asha respectively and this 600 will be divided into antenatal component and institutional delivery component so if antenatal care is complete 50 percentage will be provided and if institutional delivery is provided the rest of the 50 percentage will be provided next we move on to the janani sushu suraksha karyakram jssk it provides free entitlements for pregnant women it provides free and cashless delivery free cesarean section free drugs and consumables free diagnostics free diet during the stay in the health institutions free provision of blood exemption from user charges free transport from home to health institutions free transport between facilities in case of preferral free drop back from the institutions to home after 48 hours of stay so all are included under the free entitlements provided by jssk for pregnant mothers under jssk there are some free entitlements for sick newborns till 30 days of birth which includes all these entitlements and now this has expanded to sick infants also we move on to the pre SMA. The aim is to provide comprehensive and quality antenatal care free of cost universally to all pregnant women. PMSMA guarantees a minimum package of antenatal services to women in their second and third trimesters of pregnancy at designated government health facilities. The goal of this PMSMA is to improve the quality and coverage of antenatal care including diagnostics and counseling services as a part of RMNCH plus EA strategy. The objectives of this program is to ensure at least one antenatal checkup for all pregnant women in their second or third trimester by a physician or specialist. Improve the quality of care during the antenatal visits, that is, all applicable diagnostic services, screening for the applicable clinical conditions, appropriate management of any existing clinical conditions such as anemia, pregnancy induced hypertension, and gestational diabetes, appropriate counseling services and documentation of services, additional service opportunity to pregnant mothers who have missed antenatal visits, identification and line listing of high risk pregnancies based on obstetric medical history and existing clinical conditions appropriate birth planning and complication readiness for each pregnant mother especially those identified with risk factors and comorbid conditions special emphasis on early diagnosis adequate and appropriate management of women with malnutrition special focus on adolescent and early pregnancies as these pregnancies need extra and specialized care from pm sma we move to pm mvy that is pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana which was launched in the year 2017 earlier it was known to be indira gandhi matritva sahaya yojana pregnant and lactate mothers are eligible to three installments of maternity benefits totaling 5000 upon meeting specified requirements a beneficiary is only qualified to receive the benefits once under the scheme the benefit will be once provided to the beneficiary the objective include the financial incentives as a partial replacement for lost wages the mother will be able to get enough rest before and after delivery the cash incentives provided would lead to the improved health seeking behavior among the pregnant mothers and lactating mothers the scheme which is exclusive to tamil nadu government is dr Muthalakshmi Reddy Maternity Benefit Scheme launched in the year 1987 with an aim to reduce infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate. The financial assistance provided to antenatal mothers who are delivering in institutions has been raised to 18,000 that is 14,000 in cash and 4,000 worth nutrition kits.
benefits it has been granted to pregnant mother under dr muthulakshmi reddy maternity benefit scheme pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana the state share is 15000 and the union government share is 3000 rupees 4000 in the fourth month of pregnancy will be directly credited to the mother's account and 4000 uh, immediately after the delivery and 6000 four months after the delivery when they successfully complete the 14 weeks of vaccination the two nutrition kits would be provided during the first and second installments so that is about muthulakshmi reddy maternity benefit scheme which is the financial assistance provided in tamil nadu to encourage institutional deliveries before we end up the presentation let us look at what is maternal mortality ratio maternal mortality ratio is the ratio of total number of maternal deaths to the total number of live births multiplied by 1 lakh maternal deaths is defined as any female dying from any cause related or aggravated by pregnancy or its management which excludes the accidental or incidental causes so it is during the pregnancy and the child birth or within 42 days of pre- termination of pregnancy irrespective of the duration and site of the pregnancy so any death related or aggravated by pregnancy or its management will be considered as the maternal death so according to the sample registration system srs 2018 to 20 report india's current maternal mortality ratio is 97 maternal deaths per 1 lakh live births the global mmr in 2020 was 223 per 1 lakh live births the stg sustainable development goal target 3.1 insist on reduction of global maternal mortality ratio to 70 per 1 lakh live births and currently india is standing at 97 maternal deaths per 1 lakh live births so with this i conclude few topics or the few questions which you can encounter during an antenatal clinico social case presentation hopefully this will be helpful to face an antenatal case if you have any doubts or feedback please post it as comment if you like this video please click on the like button share it to your friends thanks for watching